Welcome to the Friendship Sermon Podcast. Friendship exists to bring people to Jesus and to develop them into fully mature reproducing followers. Gather to worship with us Sundays at 9 or 1045 or visit us online at fcbc.church. Daniel tells us, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Lord, may we have that commitment to understanding and uh, following through with your vision. May we see you. There you go. It is very fitting that we are now on Apocalypse Part 2 with everything that's been going on. You know, two or three weeks ago, we thought we had everything lined up with a couple of different presidential candidates. This past week, I was fully expecting our president to step down due to either age or other things going on. And then yesterday, we suddenly flip around and realized, you know, we almost ended up with both candidates being replaced. And so it's like, my word, what in the world is going on in the world in which we live? And how are things constantly changing? Uh, What we thought was going to happen this week is not what happens. And then you turn around and who knows what's going to take place before the end of this next week. And that's why I think it's important that God has already ordained that we have been walking through the book of Daniel. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Daniel. We are going to finish it today. We are going to finish it fast, um, mostly because all of 10, 11, and 12 all really kind of say the same thing. And so I felt it was good to put it together, (laughs) but that's a lot of scripture. When I practiced the message this week, it was 50 minutes. I'm not going to keep you that long, but we are going to be doing something a little bit differently. Usually I have you follow along in your Bibles and I go verse by verse. I'm actually going to just be kind of highlighting the chapters this morning. Um, And so it might be better to just kind of take notes, the stuff that's on the screen, that's on your bulletins. I'm just going to be pulling out a couple of key key verses that will help you understand this and and where it goes. If you've been with us over the last seven weeks, you know that we've been walking through the book of Daniel. You know that it's in Aramaic, which was written to the Gentiles, and it was also written in uh, Hebrew. So parts of it are in Hebrew, written to the Jewish people. We're concluding this part that's in Hebrew to the Jewish people to help them understand what will be happening at the end. There's that chiasm in the middle. We always love those. First half of the book is largely narrative and stories. Second half of the book is largely apocalyptic literature. We've been taking lessons out from the book of Daniel and trying to apply these lessons. And the first lesson that Pastor Steve introduced us to was that when all is bad and when you're taken captive into a foreign land and when everything is falling apart, determine not to defile yourself by remembering God's plan. Determine that God has a plan and you're not going to give in to the world around you, but you are going to stay faithful to God's plan because that's what Daniel and his friends did. Secondly, the second lesson is we saw that when Daniel and his friends suddenly had to interpret the king's dream, they immediately went to prayer. And prayer really saturates this entire book. And and what we see there is the importance of recognizing God's sovereign grace by seeking him in community. And I do believe as our world gets worse and crazier and more and more bizarre, our time together here as a church is going to be incredibly important as we come together in community every Sunday to pray and to seek God's face. The following week, we recognize that our authority determines our story. And you can click it forward for me, Grace. Uh, There it goes. Thanks. Um, Recognizing that our authority determines our story and our actions. Remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said they were not going to worship the golden image because their authority was the one true God. Daniel would only pray to God. He would not pray to the king. And because that was their authority, it gave them a different interpretation for life, which led to their actions. If our authority is God himself, that gives us a different perspective on all the world around us and the things that happen, and it leads to different actions. Our fourth lesson, 
was that the Most High rules over the kingdom of mankind, and he sets over it whom he will. And he will either take a candidate that was nearly assassinated, or he will take a candidate that is aging and struggling in areas, regardless, or he will raise up someone else. If we've not seen anything in this past week, it's that we have no idea who's going to lead our country in the future, but God himself knows, and he has no problem raising and lowering leaders. Lesson number five was that God's kingdom and his saints triumph over all evil empires. No matter how bad the world may get, no matter how crazy the world may come, God's kingdom and we, his saints, we who have believed in Jesus Christ, triumph and reign with him. Last week, we saw the importance of prayer and how prayer calls us to confess our sins as well as to confess the awesome grace and mercy of our God. And today, what we're going to see is the direct answer to that prayer as we come to Lesson 7, where we see that prayer, all of Daniel 9, Daniel's prayer, and then the prophecy that follows, enables faithfulness to Jesus. That's what I want you to take away from this morning. Not, oh, wow, Robert, it's a crazy world out there, and what do you think of that prophecy? I want you to take away faithfulness to Jesus as prayer and prophecy reveals the spiritual realm in God's plan. Never forget, it's not just the physical realm. It is the spiritual realm that we are also dealing with as God's plan leads us through the cycles of history. There are going to be ups, there's going to be downs, there's going to be ups again and downs again. Through all of those cycles, God's plan is unfolding. As I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, this is apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature is different because it's actually revelation from an otherworldly being, from God or an angel, given to a human recipient, in this case, Daniel, okay? And it discloses metaphorically, that's important, we're going to unpack that in just a minute, through dreams and visions, the spiritual world interacting with the physical world. Two weeks ago, we talked about how it's not just the temperature that it is in here and whether or not you're hungry or whether or not you're tired or what you're hearing and what you're seeing. That's all the physical world. But we acknowledge that there are most likely demons in this room. There are most likely good angels in this room. There are most likely tremendous powers and things going on. And those forces are interacting with the physical world in which we live. And prophecy enables us to see that in both the present and the future. It is intended to influence our understanding. And I hope that you leave here this morning with a better understanding. But more importantly, it influences our behavior and it makes us live differently. I don't want you to leave this morning saying, wow, I know more information. I want you to leave this morning and live differently. When it comes to interpreting the Bible, there are two different types of biblical literature, some that needs to be interpreted literally and some that needs to be interpreted metaphorically. Okay, And so it's important that we understand literal interpretation versus metaphorical interpretation. Literally, when Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, we believe that that is literal. That is true. That is straight up. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. No ifs, ands, or buts. Jesus also says that he is the vine and we are the branches. Is Jesus a stick of wood? Are we sticks of wood that grow out? Do we literally have grapes popping off of our skin and so on and so forth? No, we understand that's a metaphor. Speaking of Jesus is our source of life and we plug into him and we draw our life from him. One of the challenging things about interpreting prophecy is discerning what is a metaphor and what should be taken literally. Okay, And that's actually how, depending on whether or not you interpret the prophecy literally or interpret it metaphorically, is going to determine your conclusion. And I'm going to share that with you this morning as we work through some of these. I'll give you two other quick illustrations. Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And we're going to do this here at the end of the service. We generally, as Baptist uh, evangelicals, we interpret that metaphorically. We do not believe that this is actually the body of Christ. We believe it is just a cracker that represents the body of Christ. Our Catholic friends, who often we will bash on, they take it literally, and most of the time we take Scripture literally. They take it literally because they believe that when the priest blesses the elements, the wafers actually become the body of Christ. So before you start bashing on that's crazy stuff, like they're simply taking what Jesus said at face value. How many of you think we should take what Jesus said at face value? Most of the time, yes. So I'm just helping you understand the Bible's not always as easy to interpret as we would like. And then the Lutherans, they split the difference, and it's called transubstantiation. They don't believe it actually becomes the body, but they do believe that Jesus specifically inhabits it in a special way, whereas we would just say, it's just a cracker, smash it on the floor, we don't care. I'm a little worried about that. I've actually started to, don't worry, I'm not this side, but I do think it is a sacred time, and I think it is something we should be very special and careful with, but I do take it more metaphorically.
Are you following me? Not confusing you. I'm giving you a lot of high-level stuff because if we're going to accurately interpret Scripture, we need to understand this. The last one I'm going to throw out there is 70 times 7. Remember Peter? And he said, shall I forgive my brother seven times? What did Jesus say? Not seven, but 70 times seven, which is 490. Did Jesus mean literally you only forgive 490 times and on the 491st time you don't have to forgive anymore? Or did he mean metaphorically that you always forgive? Okay, now keep in mind, because we are getting ready to study 70 times 7, which is used three times in Scripture, once here, once in Daniel chapter 9, and once in Second Chronicles 36, where it refers to 77s of Sabbaths. And most of us, at least the circles I was raised in, take it very literally in Daniel and very metaphorically with Jesus. And you just have to be careful because you can't keep switching your metaphors in the Bible. You kind of either need to take stuff literally or metaphorically, and you have to recognize that. Are you following me? You're probably completely lost, but that's okay. Let's keep working. Take your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. I want you to maybe circle some things, jot notes in your bulletins. Again, I apologize. We are going to go pretty quickly this morning, and I am going to teach more from the screen than I am from the Bible. Again, the Bible's on the screen. It's just I don't have time to develop every single verse this morning. Daniel was praying in Daniel chapter 9, and as Phil has already read, verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, Presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. First thing I want you to notice from this passage is that God immediately dispatched Gabriel to answer his prayer. All right? When you pray, God sends answers. Now we're going to see later that another angel actually got tied up in spiritual warfare for three weeks. And sometimes the reason God doesn't answer your prayers right away is because there is spiritual battles going on in the world around us that we're not aware of. Notice at the end of verse 21 that Daniel says it happened at the time of the evening sacrifice. At this point, there has not been an evening sacrifice for 66 years. And yet Daniel still measures time by the evening sacrifice. I want you to imagine that a foreign country ransacks our country. They take over. They destroy all the churches. They make it illegal to worship. We all go underground. We meet quietly in small groups whenever we can. 66 years from now, would you still consider 1045 on Sunday morning a sacred time? Even though Daniel wasn't able to sacrifice, that's still how he marked time. It was the time for the evening sacrifice. He doesn't use a Babylonian thing and say, oh, it was 4 p.m. He says it was the time of the evening sacrifice. It's how he, it was so deeply ingrained in him, the spiritual rhythm that he had. Notice in verse 22 that the angel came to give him insight and understanding. God wanted him to know what was going on. God wants us to, go, to understand what is going on. And notice in verse 23, you are greatly loved. If God were to show up today, he would have one message for you. You are greatly loved. You might be praying for something else. God, I really need you to do this. God, I really want you to explain this. God, I really want this to happen. And God shows up. The first words out of his mouth are not, hey, let me answer this. Let me give you this prayer. It's you are greatly loved. By the way, grab your kids, grab your spouse, grab your mom or dad. Next time you're having a conversation and just say, time out. You're greatly loved. Now let's continue. What were we talking about? It's powerful communication. God loves us. Daniel had been praying because he had understood from reading Jeremiah that there was 70 years of captivity. They've had the 70 years, and so now he's saying, okay, God, what's next? And God shows up in verse, seven, in verse 24, and he says, okay, Daniel, it's not 70, but it's actually 77s, okay? So 70 weeks in your Bibles, in the Hebrew, it's actually 77s, are decreed about your people, your holy city, and there's six things that are going to happen. Daniel, it's not just 70 years, it's actually 77s, and at the end of that, we're going to have a finishing of transgression, an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision and profit, and anoint a most holy place. Now, how did we atone for iniquity? When did that happen? Jesus. Good. Not a trick question. Who put an end to sin? Jesus. Again, not a trick question. Who brings in everlasting righteousness? Jesus, okay? All of these are going to tie to the person of Jesus. Daniel has been praying, and the angel shows up and says, let me tell you about Jesus, okay? And this is where it gets really tricky and confusing. We're going to spend about 30 seconds on something that in seminary will take you a day and a half. So if this goes over your head, don't worry about it. You can Google it, okay? It's all over everywhere. 
seven sevens as you go through the rest of this passage. If the sevens equal years, seven times seven is 49 years in verse 925a, okay? From the decree to rebuild to the coming of the prince. The king decreed that they could go back and rebuild the temple in 444 BC. 49 years takes you to 395. Then if you read the second half of verse 25, it talks about a 62 sevens, a troubled time, an anointed one cut off, sanctuary destroyed. If you subtract 434 years from 395 BC, it takes you to 8033. 8033, ring a bell with anybody. That's the year we believe Jesus was crucified. You can actually do the math using solar year, or using lunar months, which is what the Hebrews use, and it actually figures out to the day from the decree to rebuild the temple till the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday works out to exactly that number of days and years. Okay? It's crazy. And then he is an anointed one cut off. That leaves you seven years. This is where we get a seven-year tribulation, the final seven until the decreed end in verse 27, okay? Now, I have to be honest with you. There were actually four decrees to rebuild the temple, and you have to work with the third one. And we believe that Jesus was crucified in either 80, 30, or 33, and you have to take 33. So there is some finagling on this, and I actually saw one guy that said actually they messed up all their chronology, and my paper's the right way to interpret it, and he reworks it all, and he still comes up with a different answer, figuring it differently. You need to be careful with prophecy. I do think that this is a very beautiful, tight timeline for Jesus' crucifixion. But I also think when we're like, how come the Jews were so stupid that they crucified him? If they would have read Daniel, they would have known it was the day. It would have been a lot harder to understand in the time. We're actually, we're kind of sliding things around to make things work rather than watching it completely unfold. Are you following me? I just want to be honest with you and have integrity in explaining this to you. The main takeaway is that prayer leads to insight, especially about Jesus. When we pray, God is going to reveal Jesus to us. And I believe that he did that with Daniel. And whether or not this 490 years worked out absolutely perfectly or not, God knows it is fascinating that you can work with the historical dates and make that happen. Okay? Now let's look at chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel's going to have a vision of a man. Okay? Look with me at verses uh, 5 and 6. I lifted up my eyes, and I looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. That doesn't sound too unnatural. Now you get to verse 6. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Does that ring a bell? That exact phrasing is used in Revelation chapter 1 to describe who? Jesus. So who is this a picture of? Probably. Okay? Because later on, it, so there's three men that show up in this passage. The last man ends up fighting in verse 13. This messenger faces demonic opposition and gets tied up for three weeks. Would Jesus get tied up for three weeks fight, fight, uh, fighting demons? No, he would be more powerful than that. So there are two options. Either one, this is an angel that looks a lot like Jesus who got tied up fighting uh, demons and it's the same man throughout the passage. Or there are three different men. The first is a vision of Jesus and then there's an angel, that, two different angels that come and talk to Daniel about it. I'm not sure which one it is. The commentators are split on it. I do find it very interesting that these verses are very close parallels to Revelation chapter 1. If you had to pin me to a wall, I'd say it probably was Jesus and then later an angel describing it. But I just don't want to be dogmatic. I try to be very open and honest with you guys and let you understand. And I believe you have the same Holy Spirit. And you can read this passage and tell me if it's the same man throughout or if it's three different men. Are you following me? Again, what do we want to take out, though? I just want to highlight some key things. What does he say in verse 11? Daniel, you are greatly loved. All right? And notice on verse 12, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard and I have come because of your words. Well, why didn't he get a prayer answered for three weeks? Because verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days until Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So Michael the archangel comes, helps him, they overpower the demons. When you're praying, you have no idea what's going on in the spiritual world. Don't stop praying. Don't quit praying Keep pressing in. God is working, and I want you to understand that. 
Again, verse 19, third time in this passage that Daniel is declared to be greatly loved. All right? O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And I said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. God comes to encourage us and to remind us that the spiritual fight will continue as kingdoms rise and fall. That's how the chapter ends. Kingdoms are going to constantly rise and fall. The spiritual world is very active, but God is still at work. I want you to take away from this whole chapter that Jesus and his angels are going to constantly strengthen you in the midst of your spiritual battles. No matter what you are facing, God is going to send Jesus and his angels to encourage you. And I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, but as you pray and as you seek God's face, rest assured that he has his hand on your life and he will strengthen and equip you. Chapter 11 is a long chapter and we could have gone through it again and taken a lot of time. But largely speaking, from verses 3 to 35, and all the commentators agree on this, it is basically an unfolding of history over like a 200-year period from 323 to 125. I should have put a map up here on the screen, but basically you have the Mediterranean Sea and Israel is parked right here, right? And you have Syria up north and you have Egypt down below Israel. And basically in all of chapter 11, Egypt and Syria are going to battle back and forth. And what's the stomping ground going to be? the poor nation of Israel, all right? And what is fascinating is historians, secular historians have gone through this chapter and all the little phrasing, it talks about like four different Egyptian kings and four different Syrian kings and how they trade power and go back and forth. And you can actually confirm it all in secular history, okay? So again, God's word is specific. God's word is accurate. And the key thing that stood out to me is, again, I saw this in a cool commentary. I was like, man, that's awesome. And I went through and circled it. There are 18 buts in this passage. What does that show? Kings rise, kings fall, but who's in control? God. I'll just show a couple of them to you. I should have put the whole passage up here and highlighted them like I do sometimes for you. Look at verse 5. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule. How many times have you seen, you know, the immediate candidate in a race begins to pull ahead, but then what happens? Another candidate overtakes them, right? God is behind all of this. Look in the middle of verse 6. Um, the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, and that's actually cited in secular history, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. The agreement fell through and she got executed. Um, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up and her attendants, he who followed her and he who supported her in those times, and the whole family gets executed again. I could take time to teach you every phrase in this. Just trust me when I say that this is recording this history and God is clearly raising and lowering kings. Okay. Notice how specific it is. Notice how literal it is. And now we get to the end of the passage. From verses 36 to 45, it doesn't fit history real well. Okay, It ends around verse 35 with Antiochus IV Epiphanes. I introduced you to him a couple of weeks ago. He was a really bad dude. He did horrible things and destroyed the nation of Israel. They hated him. And so some people think that these last 10 verses that are really brutal and really horrible and describe a really bad guy describes Antiochus Epiphanes. The problem is it doesn't match history as perfectly as the rest of the passage. In fact, where the end of the passage says he dies, Antiochus died somewhere else, and you really have to start going super metaphorically to make that view fit. So other people say, well, it's somewhat metaphorical. It's actually describing when Titus destroyed the temple in AD 70. So after Jesus goes back to heaven, 40 years later, Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And that actually sounds a little more like the last 10 verses of Daniel. But even that's not a perfect fit. So then some people take it very literal and they say the last 10 verses are actually a description of the Antichrist that is going to come during the seven-year tribulation. So a lot of people that really believe in the seven-year tribulation, they'll go to these last 10 verses of Daniel and they'll say, this is the Antichrist. It's going to be just as literal as the first part of chapter 11. This is describing the Antichrist. That sounds good, but what's the problem with that? There's a 2,000-year gap. So the first part of chapter 11 is unfolding king after king after king after king after king till verse 35. And then Daniel suddenly jumps to 2,000 years in the future that hasn't even happened yet and describes the Antichrist without even catching his breath. That's kind of problematic too. What I want you to understand is that all the views have problems. 
okay? And that's why I'm not going to be dogmatic about one particular view. I actually tend to split the middle, and I tend to think all three are right, okay? (laughs) And the reason for that is often in Scripture, prophecies had a near fulfillment, and they had a far fulfillment, God would immediately do something for his current people that received the prophecy to show that he actually meant what he said, but the actual specific fulfillment would be in the future. It's described as kind of a mountain range. Oftentimes, the prophets would be describing this picture, and they would describe this mountain, and then they would begin to describe this mountain, and then they would begin to describe this one and this one, and you would almost think that it's one big mountain, but in reality, you know, how far is the gap from here to here? It doesn't look far. You could probably jump it. It's probably, you know, 20 miles. Isn't it crazy how far things are? Paula and I were down at Solomon's Island yesterday, and we were sitting on the boardwalk, uh, Solomon Island boardwalk, and there's the bridge. Is it the Harry Nice Bridge or whatever it is? It's not Harry Nice. Whatever's, what's the end of the county bridge? Solomon's Island Bridge. Yeah, right? And, and people keep jumping off of that and, you know, and dying. And I, I sat there, and I thought, if somebody jumped, I'd swim out and save them because I'm a hero. And I, got, I thought I could be there, like, super fast. And if you've been down there... I think it's like three miles away by that point when I began to realize like how far we were driving. It looks like the bridge is right there, but no, it's like three miles away. And so I think sometimes in scripture, we have a prophecy that looks like it's going to be immediate, but in reality, it's actually going to be a lot further away or part of it will be immediate and part of it will be much further away. A couple of quick examples to help you understand this. Remember Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit and God came down. What did he say about the serpent to, to Eve? that the serpent will bruise, you will have uh, a seed, you will have a son, and the serpent will bruise his heel, but he will crush his head. What did Eve say as soon as Cain was born? This is the prophecy. Well, it wasn't Cain, but then when Seth came, she said, God has given me a replacement. Eve took her son to be the Messiah. Was he? No. But was he the start of the line to the Messiah? Seth was. And then what did Jesus come? Jesus came and crushed Satan's head. But is Satan fully dead yet? No. So we have an immediate fulfillment. We have an even bigger fulfillment at the cross. But then ultimately Jesus' future rule. Um, The day of the Lord in the Old Testament often prophesies to like the time when Daniel was deported. That was considered the day of the Lord when Jerusalem fell. But there's a lot of other times when the day of the Lord in the Old Testament very clearly is referencing the future coming of Jesus. Don't we even pray God, your kingdom come, let your will be done in the Lord's prayer because God's kingdom is future. But what did Jesus say? The kingdom is now. The kingdom is among you. So there's this kind of like immediate and future, immediate and future idea throughout scripture. So it could be that this seventh, this end of chapter 11 in this, this last, these last 10 verses did kind of sort of be fulfilled in Antiochus, the fourth epiphanies, could have looked forward to Titus destroying the temple and could also look forward to the Antichrist all three together. I don't know. You, you take your pick. I'm not going to kick you out of the church for your belief. A lot of good Christians believe different things. I just want to try to help you understand it. Did I go completely over your head? All right. Do we kind of sort of get that? All right. Now let's do our takeaway. What do we absorb from the kings of the south and the kings of the north? Grace, it's locked up on me again. Can you click me forward? I appreciate it. I don't know why it does that sometimes. There we go. Our takeaway is that the kingdoms rise and they fall but God's plan endures forever, okay? That's what we take away. Whether or not that last 10 verses was past, whether it's future, kingdoms rise and fall, but God's plan endures forever. That being said, let's go to chapter 12 and let's finish the book. In chapter 12, I wish I had time to read it to you. I'm just gonna pull out again some of the highlights that I want you to see. Notice in verse one, there's a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. There is coming a great time of trouble. That being said, the world is consistently getting worse. Did you know that more Christians were killed in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined? Okay, as Americans, we live very sheltered lives, but around the world, North Korea, China, parts of Africa, like there's a lot of intense spiritual persecution that the world is getting worse for Christians, okay? So there is going to be a great time of trouble. In verses 2 and 3, you're going to see one of the few references in the Old Testament to the resurrection. The resurrection is largely a New Testament doctrine, but in the Old Testament, there was a promise of it. Notice what it says. At that time, your people will be delivered. In verse 2, a many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
By the way, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. All right. Daniel asked, how long is this going to be? And you're going to notice that the, the angel responds, it's going to be time, times, and half a time. So that's three and a half years. And at the very end of the passage, you're going to notice what it says, that it's going to be 1,290 days down in verse 11. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. Well, wait, is it 1290 or is it 1335? How do you reconcile a 45-day difference? I don't know, okay? And I'm confused, and notice Daniel was confused. Do you see that in verse 8? I heard, but I did not understand. Even Daniel, when he received this prophecy, did not fully understand what was going on. But notice how it concludes in verse 13. Go your way till the end. You will rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. How long is it going to be? I don't fully know. I love what one commentator said is what's the difference between 1290 and 1335, that extra 45 days. He said, you just got to keep pressing on. You may reach the end of the tribulation and be like, okay, Jesus, it's over. Where are you? How many of you have reached what you thought was the end? Doctors said mom had, what, six months to live. You endured through six months. Mom was barely hanging on. You were exhausted. She was exhausted. Everybody was exhausted. Six months were up. She should have been gone. And what'd she do? Hung around another month. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's what happens. God tells us, press through to the end. Is it going to be 12,990 days? Or are you going to need to press through till 1335? Regardless, you keep your eyes on Jesus. And you keep on keeping on. And stand in your place to what God has allotted to you. Because God preserves those who remain faithful to him. Regardless of what happens in the future, regardless of how crazy the world gets, may we stay faithful to God and know that he will preserve us through every challenge. He preserved Daniel. He preserved his friends. He was faithful to Daniel to the end. Application. What do we take away from all this? I know I went so quickly. I wish I could have gone so much more slowly. But what I want you to see from the big picture is that prophecy reveals Jesus. In the midst of all the spiritual upheaval and the history and the change and all the things taking place, we should always look for Jesus. Where do you see Jesus in our country? Where do you see Jesus in your school? Where do you see Jesus in your workplace? All right? In the midst of challenges, okay? As your boss gets traded out and you get a horrible boss, or maybe you get a great boss, or as you get a great teacher next year, or you get a horrible teacher, or we get a great president, or we get a horrible president, anything begins to change. Prophecy and prayer encourages us to keep our minds on Jesus and to recognize that this season we're in, whether it's good, whether it's bad, it'll pass and there'll be another season and Jesus will still be there. And God is going to preserve us through that spiritual and historical tumult. God will preserve you. And if you will keep your eyes on Jesus, you can be confident of that and you can be encouraged in everything that you face. Can I encourage you when it comes to prophecy to be very careful of being overconfident of details? I was raised in an environment that really loved prophetic details and we were raised on all the charts and all of this and everything in Revelation and everything in Daniel was assigned to this person, this person, this person, this person. As the world has changed and gone on, those people have died and passed away and suddenly... You end up looking like an idiot as a pastor when you do those kind of things. I had to laugh this morning. Do you know one of the marks of the false prophet in Revelation 13.3 of the beast? He has a mortal head wound that healed. Okay, can you say that? That's a joke. You can't preach that. Because that's just taking, oh, I saw this on the news. Oh, I found this verse. Slap them together. Now I get to write books and be famous. Guys, don't look like idiots. Be honest. Is the future, you know, is is the Antichrist going to have a mortal head wound that is healed? Well, it says so in Revelation. Does that mean that what happened yesterday is the mortal head wound? Who knows? You know, like, there's no, we're not even going to go there. Like, that's a God thing, not for us. Be very careful about, that's why I've tried not to be dogmatic this morning but I've tried to just help you understand the big picture of prophecy. Jesus is in control. That's what I'm dogmatic about, okay? Questions for you. What kingdoms have you seen rise and fall 
I'm finally getting old enough that I'm watching countries rise and countries fall. But even in your workplace, is your, has your workplace gotten bought out by your company, has bought out by this? How many of you have seen different bosses come, bosses go? How many of you have seen different teachers come, teachers go? God is teaching you something. God is doing something in each one of those situations. And we would do well to ask ourselves, God, what are you doing in these situations? Secondly, we would do well to ask ourselves in what ways are spiritual forces at work? Don't interpret everything just through the physical world, okay? There's a very real possibility that the guy didn't miss yesterday, but that either an angel, you know, just bumped the gun a little bit or pushed Trump's head one side or the other. Like, there's very real, if you could see all the spiritual forces that are at work one way or another, there's a lot going on in our world. So we need to be aware of that. We're not trying to find demons behind every bush, But we are trying to be very cognizant that what we see is not all that exists, but there is a spiritual force at work in our world. And then mostly important, how can we be faithful to Jesus during spiritual and historical tumult? Kingdoms are going to rise. Kingdoms are going to fall. Spiritual good forces are going to push one way. Bad forces are going to push another. Our life is going to be like this. I looked to find a roller coaster video, but you had to pay 20 bucks to get it. So I I got this picture. It doesn't... It's, and it's kind of cool, but I guess I, are we on like those light waves and we're traveling and we're going and we're doing this and it does feel like sometimes we're like, wow, look at what God's doing in our country and oh my word, our country's crashing. Oh wow, look at what God's doing in my family. Oh no, my family's falling apart. Wow, look at what God's doing in my company or look at what God's doing at work. Look at what God's doing in my school. Oh man, my school's falling apart. And then at the same time, man, I really feel satanic opposition. Whoa, I really feel spiritual. Like your life is going to do this. But what I want you to walk away from this morning and what I want you to know more than anything is that even as your life is doing this and even as our world is doing this, God is directing every bit of that. And when you're on a roller coaster, you get on the Joker at Six Flags and they launch you out of that thing and then it just starts doing this number and you lose your lunch this way and everything else, you begin to think that thing's off the rails. But the beauty of a roller coaster is, is is it ever out of control? And will it end exactly where it was designed to end? Yes. No matter how many times it corkscrews you, no matter how many times it goes up, no matter how many times it goes down and all around and everything else, and you think you're going to die, are you going to die? No. You're going to come slamming back into the station. So do I know what kind of curves lie ahead? I know there's going to be a bunch. There's going to be good things, bad things, spiritual things, good, bad spirits, everything. But I know this more than anything. God's will is going to bring that coaster right back into the station exactly when and where he wants it. And that's what we take away from prophecy. Heavenly Father, my prayer and my hope is that we would just love the coaster ride. And when we're way up top and it's a good season and we can see the whole park, that we might just praise you for the view. And when we're hurtling down into the abyss and flipped upside down and yanked side to side, that we might just hang on tight and know that you'll bring us back out into a beautiful season one day. But God, in all of the twists and all of the turns, may we be aware of the spiritual forces that are at play as well. And may we keep our eyes on Jesus and know that you are working all things together according to the counsel of your will. May we study your word. May we see prophecy. May we hold it up and compare it to the world around us and ask, is this how you're unfolding this, God? Is this what you're doing? Would we be very careful with scripture and and discern the parts that are metaphorical and the parts that are literal? And may we utilize them in a way that brings glory and honor to you. Because all of scripture, Jesus, it all talks about you. So may we always walk away loving you more because that's what you've called us to. And I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.